Hi, I'm John Kessel, and I am, among other things, a writer of science fiction. Um, I'm going to give a talk today uh, titled, How to Be Strange. Uh, I know it may be hard to believe looking at me, but at some point, way back in the mid-20th century, I was a young person. And I want to talk about how strange the world can seem to us when we are new to it, and about science fiction, and about the future. I've been reading science fiction, which from here forward I will call SF, since I was a boy, and writing it since I was in grade school, uh, getting it rejected from magazines since I was in seventh grade, and publishing it since I was in graduate school. When I was a kid, anybody who liked science fiction was considered a little odd. It was that crazy Buck Rogers stuff associated with bad movies, where stuntmen in rubber suits stumbled out of black lagoons or silver flying saucers in search of helpless starlets. Maybe it was okay to be a science fiction fan when you were a teenager, but to maintain that interest into adulthood marked you as strange. Since then, sci-fi has conquered the world. It seems that half the movies and TV shows made today have some element of science fiction or fantasy. It gets big budgets, A-list actors, and amazing special effects. But it seems to me that these movies and TV are often just as clunky as those Saturday matinees I saw in 1962. And among serious people, a liking for science fiction is still considered unfortunate. It's easy to make fun of bad science fiction, but I like to reserve the right to criticize it to myself. It's like your family. You grew up in your family, you suffered with, with and in it, and therefore you feel you've earned the right to complain about your mother's taste in furniture or your brother's taste in girlfriends. But heaven help the outsider who presumes to criticize your family. You resent him and you defend them. So let me tell you what I think science fiction is not. This is meant mostly for those of you who haven't read much of it or who have built your impressions from what you see on TV and in the movies. Science fiction is not about science. Though most serious science fiction writers take some care that their stories not violate what we know to be true today about the way the universe works, you could not have SF without allowing the freedom to speculate wildly. A lot of science fiction contains about as much science as fairy tales, and such stories sometimes serve similar purposes to fairy tales. More about that later. Science fiction is not about technology. Though technology is everywhere in SF, the reason is that for 200 years now, technology has been a driving force behind the massive changes that have taken place in the way we live. But though you ought to have some respect for facts, you don't need to have a degree in physics to write SF, and you certainly don't need one to read and enjoy it. Science fiction is not about predicting the future, and SF writers are not prophets. Yes, science fiction stories featured atomic bombs long before Hiroshima, and offered rocket travel to the moon a generation before Neil Armstrong, and was full of computers when Bill Gates was a gleam in his father's eye. But the computer in 1950s science fiction wasn't the one that you carry in your pocket. Uh, as far as I know, nobody in science fiction predicted this device, which contains the functions of what we would, would have taken a, a room full of machines in 1975. A telephone, a still camera, a movie camera, a photo album, a television, a tape recorder, a calculator, a dictionary, an encyclopedia, a whole library even. A radio, a record collection, a stereo phonograph, tape player, a road atlas, a wallet, a credit card, a notebook, a teletype, a newspaper, a, a live weather map. I won't mention the metronome and star map and pedometer that I have on my phone. Nobody in science fiction predicted the internet or the fact that I can go home tonight and waste a couple of hours downloading kitten videos from some database on another continent. To call a science fiction writer a prophet is like calling a man shooting a rifle at the side of a barn who misses it nine times out of ten, a marksman. If these aren't the reasons to read science fiction, then why am I still reading it, let alone writing it? The answer has something to do with the golden age of science fiction. Sci-fi fans have argued for a long time of when was the golden age of science fiction. 
Was it the 1930s when Flash Gordon soared through the movie serials on Saturday afternoons? The 1940s when Isaac Asimov and Robert Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke wrote their first stories? The 1950s when we had that first deluge of science fiction movies bad as they might have been? Maybe it was the 70s which brought us George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, and Star Wars. Or perhaps it's the present, when sci-fi is everywhere in pop culture. Well, the best answer I've heard to the question, what is the golden age of science fiction, is 12. Most of the people who get seriously hooked on sci-fi are 12 when it happens. Why? 12-year-olds need to escape. They don't control their lives. Adults do. 12-year-olds are old enough to do some things, but not free enough to do them with impunity, thank God. Most of us forget how desperately eager we were to grow up when we were teenagers, how agonizingly slowly the days seemed to pass, how bored we often were with our lives when we were not distressed by them. If you could have read my mind when I was 12, you would have heard me screaming, get me out of here. I won't go into the circumstances that drove me to want to escape. In most ways, they were, the, they were the unexceptional frustrations that, sadly, so many young people feel. For most of us who turn to science fiction at that age, escape is a fundamental motivation. I used to be sensitive about being called an escapist. Many parents get worried when their kids show an obsession with the fantastic. But J.R.R. Tolkien offered a defense of kids like me by distinguishing between the escape of the prisoner and the flight of the deserter. Most of us don't have much sympathy for the man who deserts his duty under fire, but we have considerably more for the one who is unfairly imprisoned. Tolkien's friend, the writer C.S. Lewis, pointed out that the class of people most worried about other people escaping are jailers. I would suggest that we might think twice before we consider an interest in the fantastic to be a sign of desertion. We don't want to become jailers. In other words, escape is a natural human need. Not only that, escape can be a new way of coming back to where we started from. True voyage is return, says the science fiction writer Ursula K. Le Guin in one of her works. Like the space traveler in Einstein's parable about the twins who goes away and comes back to a transformed world and a new perspective, the science fiction writer can use the future as a crazy funhouse mirror to reflect the world we live in. To illustrate what I mean by this, let me read you the beginning of a story published in 1961 when I was 11 years old by a writer named Cordwainer Smith. It was titled Alpha Ralpha Boulevard. It's about two young lovers, Paul and Virginia. So I'll begin the story here. We were drunk with happiness in those early years. Everybody was, especially the young people. These were the first years of the rediscovery of man, when the instrumentality dug deep into the treasury, reconstructing the old cultures, the old languages, and even the old troubles. The nightmare of perfection had taken our forefathers to the edge of suicide. Now, under the leadership of the Lord Jestacost and the Lady Alice Moore, the ancient civilizations were rising like great land masses out of the sea of the past. I myself was the first man to put a postage stamp on a letter after 14,000 years. I took Virginia to hear the first piano recital. We watched at the eye machine when cholera was released in Tasmania and we saw the Tasmanians dancing in the streets now that they did not have to be protected anymore. Everywhere, things became exciting. Everywhere, men and women worked with a wild will to build a more imperfect world. I myself went into a hospital and came out French. Virginia was French too, and we had the years of our future lying ahead of us like ripe fruit hanging in an orchard of perpetual summers. We had no, I no idea when we would die. Let's unpack some of the details of, of this passage. I'll quote some things and we'll think about it. Quote, the nightmare of perfection had taken our forefathers to the edge of suicide. Would a perfect way of life be oppressive? Might it cause despair? Quote, 
I myself was the first man to put a postage stamp on a letter after 14,000 years. Smith here is pointing out that a postage stamp is an invention. It comes out of a certain historical time and place and represents a series of assumptions, a system of interconnection that to somebody who came from a different time and place might seem strange. It's already starting to seem strange to young people, I think, today, who never write letters or seldom use stamps. Add to this the fact that in the story, people are still around 14,000 years after the postage stamp is extinct. We've only had recorded history for 5,000 years. So these people are three times farther into the future than we are from the beginning of our history, as far into our future as we are from the Cro-Magnon humans. Another quote, uh, from when cholera was released, released in Tasmania, we saw the Tasmanians dancing in the streets. Why would people dance in the streets at the release of a deadly plague into the population? Maybe for people who are immortal, death would be a novel experience, even a desirable one. Death, instead of being com a commonplace, becomes a strange phenomenon. Is there a positive side to death? How does the inexplicable fact of it affect how we live? What would people who never have experienced it think of it? Quote, I myself went into a hospital and came out French. And we laugh at this one as if being French were a medical condition or it could be performed like plastic surgery. What is the relation of nationality to biology? Can nationality or language be compared to a physical condition? Perhaps Smith is making fun of ethnic stereotyping. Quote, Everywhere things became exciting. Everywhere men and women worked with a wild will to build a more imperfect world. This one flips our cliché on its head. We've sought for centuries to build a more perfect world. These people are tired of, of perfection. Later in the story, Paul and Virginia travel to a place they have never been before. And there's this passage, a walkway littered with white objects, knobs and rods and imperfectly formed balls about the size of my head. Virginia stood beside me, silent. About the size of my head? I kicked one of the objects aside and then knew, knew for sure what it was. It was people, the inside parts. I had never seen such things before. And that, that on the ground, must once have been a hand. There were hundreds of such things along the wall. Paul and Virginia have never seen a skeleton. The fear we have of death, the entire mythology and imagery and ramifications of death that are so familiar to us are completely unknown to them. The basic principle Smith follows here is to make the familiar seem strange and at the same time make the astounding seem ordinary. This element of estrangement is so important to science fiction that some, of his, some have suggested that it be called the literature of cognitive estrangement. I read science fiction for moments like these, and I write it to create them. It's like rock and roll or jazz it takes familiar elements and twists them into something surprising. If you can't see how this might be valuable, if you think that this is mildly interesting but so what, if the absurdity of Cordwainer Smith's world strikes you as only absurdity and nothing more, then you probably won't like a lot of science fiction. Which brings me back to why science fiction appeals to the young. For many young people, the world is an absurd place. Think of every child as a little alien landed on Earth, here to do an extended study of human beings. They live among us in disguise. They sit across from us at the breakfast table, or maybe they speed past out the door as we stare blearily into our cup of coffee. We may think we know them, but we don't. Meanwhile, they study our habits and hobbies, learning to simulate humanity. We send them to school to socialize them. We tell them they need to learn the way the world works. Some of them, most of us, get so good at it that we can pass for human the rest of our lives. In science fiction, we remind ourselves what most teenagers have not yet forgotten, how arbitrary the world is. The way things are today may not be the only way that they could be. Change is a constant in human history. SF is founded on this belief. 
It makes us take a more detached view of the things around us. It encourages, it encourages us to expect, even embrace, change. Far from being escapism, this can be of real value to an adult, the most stimulating way to engage reality. The man who wrote the passages I read to you, Cordwainer Smith, was a pseudonym for Paul Myron Anthony Linebarger. He was born in 1913 and died in 1966. He was a professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University. His father was a retired American judge who helped finance the Chinese Revolution in 1911 and became the legal advisor to Sun Yat-sen, the first president of the Republic of China. Linebarger spent much of his youth in China. Later, he lived in Japan, Germany, and France. During World War II, he worked for U.S. intelligence in the Far East and after the war as a diplomat and respected authority on Asian affairs. He wrote scholarly studies of Chinese politics and for what was for many years the standard textbook on psychological warfare. And as Cordwainer Smith, he wrote science fiction. Cordwainer Smith's stories of the future ring with echoes of Paul Leinbarger's experiences in foreign cultures. They have an arresting strangeness. Smith's characters struggle with issues of power, freedom, limitation, tragedy, joy, love, and loss. His people may be different from our neighbors, but they are real. And they prove that in order to write good science fiction, you need to know a lot about the real world. So here we are, in a world that's changing faster than ever, the beginning of the third millennium of the Christian era, with the prospect of more change to follow, of climate disasters that threaten the way we live, of technologies and social movements that are likely to make our grandchildren's lives in some ways as incomprehensible to us as ours would be to our grandparents. In this context, science fiction is a way of exploring alternatives. Albert Schweitzer once said, man is a very clever animal that behaves like an idiot. The paradox of that statement encapsulates much of the feeling that I get from the best SF. We are a little lower than the angels and higher than the beasts. Science fiction offers many images of the collision between our stunning intellect, our ambitions to grasp the stars, the abilities that have given humanity mastery over the physical world, and the emotional and moral and ethical pratfalls that threaten to make that mastery a curse rather than a blessing. It can't hurt us to think about these things a little. In fact, that's how the science fiction writer Frederick Pohl defined science fiction. Science fiction, he said, is a way of thinking about things. As for what I write, some of it might surprise you. It doesn't always look like what most people think of when they think of science fiction. I'm not really into stories about outer space or alien invasions or blowing up planets. My fiction is not like Star Wars or Star Trek. It's more like that older TV show, The Twilight Zone. I like to use the strange element, the future, the other world, the time machine, to explore why people do the things that they do and the ethics of those choices. My stories often come from some odd juxtaposition, from asking some what-if question that might not even have anything to do with the future or technology. Why are men and women the way they are? How much of it is a matter of biology, and how much is a result of the society and culture they are born into and grow up in? What if superior aliens came to Earth not to conquer us or bring salvation, but because they are addicted to cocaine? What if there were a society in which, in return for giving up the right to vote, men could have all the sex they want at any time without having any responsibility ever to function as fathers? What if time-traveling tourists from the future could go into the past and exploit historical figures without worrying about changing history? George Bush Sr. and Fidel Castro were both excellent baseball players in college. What would have happened if Bush and Castro in the 1950s had become major league baseball players instead of politicians? What if one of the Bennett sisters from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice were to meet and fall in love with Mary Shelley's Victor Frankenstein. 
except she doesn't know that Victor is being blackmailed by his monster to create a bride for him. I've written stories based of all, on all of these daydreams. In my books, I get to play games with the past and the future. I can create characters and put them in situations that challenge their sense of right and wrong, their faith in one another, the choices in their lives, and the, their ways of survival. I like to tell a good story, too, one where you care about the characters and wonder what is going to happen to them. No matter how strange the background of my fiction may be, I want the people to be real and understandable. And, as much as possible, I want to challenge our habitual ways of seeing things. Some 25 years ago, I was at a conference in Florida with a bunch of science fiction writers. The comet Hayakutake was making its closest approach to the Earth that same weekend. In the middle of the night, a crowd of SF writers in their 40s, excited as a bunch of 12-year-olds, went out onto the hotel roof to see it. One of the writers had a telescope in his SUV, and he set it up there. We looked up at the sky and found the fuzzy dot that was a ball of ice and gas that had been orbiting the sun since the dinosaurs walked where we live today. Its orbital period, the time it takes to go one time around the sun, is 70,000 years. You and I won't be here to see it when it comes around again. Will the human race be here? The earth is small. Time is long. If they survive, as I sincerely hope they will, what will our descendants believe? What values will they have? These are not questions that we spend our adult lives worrying about. In the very best way, they are childish questions. But to ask them is invigorating. It puts this month's mortgage payment in a different light. I've made my life by doggedly following the things that fascinated me when I was 12. I've managed to get practical enough to survive. That mortgage has to be paid. But I remain foolish enough not to let go of what fascinated me back then. One of my other favorite writers, Herman Melville, left a note attached to the inside of his writing desk that was only found after his death. I think of this note as a message to all of us. The last 30 years of Melville's life had been a series of disappointments. From the age of 40 on, he was unable to make his living as a writer and worked as a customs inspector to support his family. Two of his four children, both of his sons, died young. He lived in increasing obscurity, but still kept writing, though publishers did not want his books anymore. Every time Melville would open his desk to write, he would see this note, which I pass on to you. Keep true to the dreams of thy youth. Well, uh, I'm going to finish up here by reading the beginning of a story that I wrote a long time ago, and that is going to be the first in a collection of my stories that will be coming out in 2022. Uh, this is the cover of the book. It's called The Dark Ride. And uh, this story, uh, uh, I, I was using the science fiction alteration of the world to comment on the America that I grew up in. Um, I won't say much more than that to preface this. I think the story explains itself. But uh, you might keep an eye out for the ways in which I juxtapose the strange details of the setting with the ordinariness of the family I set into it. The title of the story is not responsible, park and lock it. No, I'm just going to read the first scene. Not responsible, park and lock it. David Baker was born in the back seat of his parents' Chevy in the great mechanized lot at mile 1.375 times 10 to the 25th. George, we need to stop, his mother Polly said. I'm having pains. She was a week early. They had been cruising along pretty well at twilight, his father concentrating on getting in another 50 miles before dark, when they were cut off by a big two-toned mercury, and George had to swerve four lanes over to the far right. George and Polly later decided that the near accident was the cause of the premature birth. They even managed to laugh at the incident in retrospect. They ruefully retold the story many times, so that it was one of the family fables that David grew up with. But David always suspected his father pined after those lost 50 miles. In return, he'd gotten a son. Not responsible! Park and lock it! The loudspeakers at the tops of the poles in the vast asphalt field shouted over and over. For a first birth, Polly's labor was surprisingly short, 
and the robot doctor emerged from the Chevy in the gathering evening with a healthy seven-pound boy. George Baker flipped his cigarette away nervously, the butt glowing as it spun into the night. He smiled. In the morning, George stepped into the bar at the first rest stop, had a quick one, and registered his name. David John Baker, born 815 Standard Westbound Time, June 13th. What year is it, George asked the bartender. 802,701, the robot smiled benignly. It could not do otherwise. 802,701, George repeated it aloud and punched the keys of the terminal. 802,701, the numbers spun themselves out like a song. 802701. David's mother had smiled weakly, reclining in the passenger seat when they'd started again. Her smile had never been strong. David slept on her breast. Much later, Polly told David what a good baby he'd been, not like his younger sister Caroline, who had the colic. David took satisfaction in that. He was the good one. It made the competition between him and Caroline even more intense. But that was later. As a baby, David slept to the steady thrumming of the V8 engine, the gentle rocking of the car. He was cooed at by the android attendants at the camps where they pulled over at the end of the day. His father would chat with the machine that came over to check the odometer and validate their mileage card. George would tell about any of the interesting things that had happened on the road, and he always seemed to have something. While Polly fixed supper at one of the grills, and the ladies from the other cars sat around in a circle in front of the comfy cabins and talked about their children, their husbands, about their pregnancies, and how seldom they got to drive. David sat on Polly's lap or played with the other kids. Once past the toddler stage, he followed his dad around and watched, a little scared, as the greasy, self-assured robots busied themselves about the service station. They were large and composed. The young, the young single drivers tried hard to compete with their mechanical self-containment. David hung on everything his dad said. The common driving man, George Baker said, hands on the wheel. The good, average driver doesn't know his asshole from a tailpipe. Polly would draw David to her as if to blot out the words, George. All right, the kid will know whether you want him to or not. But David didn't know, and they wouldn't tell him. That was the way of parents. They never told you, even when they thought they were explaining everything. And so David was left to wonder and learn as best he could. He watched the land speed by long before he had words to say what he saw. He listened to his father tell his mother what was wrong and right with the world. And the sun set every night at the other end of that world, far ahead of them still beyond the gas stations and the wash and brush up buildings and the quietly deferential androids that always seemed the same no matter how far they'd gone that day westbound. When David was six he got to sit on George's lap, hold the wheel in his hands and drive the car. With what great chasms of anticipation and awe did he look forward to those moments? His father would say suddenly after hours of driving in silence, come sit on my lap David you can drive. Polly would protest feebly that he was too young. It was dangerous. David would clamber into his dad's lap and grab the wheel. How warm it felt, how large, and how far apart he had to put his hands. The indentations on the back were too wide for his fingers, so that two of his fit in the space meant for one adult. George would move the seat up and scrunch his thin legs together so that David could see over the hood of the car. His father operated the pedals in the gear shift. And most of the time, he kept his left hand on the wheel, too. But then, he would slowly take it away, and David would be steering all by himself. His heart had beaten fast. At those moments, the car had seemed so large. The promise and threat of its speed had been almost overwhelming. He knew that by a turn of the wheel, he could be in the high speed lane. He knew, even more amazingly, that he held in his hands the potential to steer them off the road, into the gully, and death. The responsibility was great, and David took it seriously. He didn't want to do anything foolish. He didn't want to make George think him any less a man. He knew his mother was watching. Whether she had love or fear in his eyes, he could not know, because he couldn't take his eyes from the road to see.
When David was seven, there was a song on the radio that Polly sang to him, We All Drive On. That was his song. David sang it back to her, and his father laughed and sang it too badly, voice hoarse and off-key, not like his mother, whose voice was sweet. We all drive on, they sang together, you and me and everyone, never ending, just begun, driving, driving on. Goddamn right we drive on, George said, goddamn pack of maniacs. David remembered clearly the first time he became aware of the knapsack and the notebook. It was one evening after they'd eaten supper and were waiting for Polly to get the cabin ready for bed. George went around to the trunk to check the spare, and this time he took out a green knapsack and, in the darkness, near the edge of the campground, secretively opened it. Watch, David, and keep your mouth shut about what you see. David watched. This is for emergencies. George, one by one, set the things on the ground. First a rolled, rolled oil cloth, which he spread out, then a line of tools, then a gun and boxes of bullets, a first aid kit, some packages of crackers and dried fruit, and some things David didn't know. One thing had a light and a thick wire with batteries. This is a metal detector, David. I made it myself. George took a bit black book from the sack. This is my notebook. He handed it to David. It was heavy and smelled of the trunk. Maps of the median and... George! Polly's voice was a harsh whisper, and David jumped a foot. She grabbed his arm. George looked exasperated and a little guilty, though David did not identify his father's reaction as guilt until he thought about it much later. He was too busy trying to avoid the licking he thought was coming. His mother marched him back to the cabin after giving George her best withering gaze. But Mom! To sleep! Don't puzzle yourself about things that you aren't meant to know, young man. David puzzled himself. At times, the knapsack and the notebook filled his thoughts. His father would give him a curious glance and tantalizingly vague answers whenever David asked about them, safely out of earshot of Polly. Shortly after that, Caroline was born. This time, the Bakers were not caught by surprise, and Caroline came into the world at the hospital at mile 1.375 times 10 to the 25th where they stopped for three whole days for Polly's lying in. Nobody stopped for three whole days for anything. David was impatient. They'd never get anywhere waiting. And the androids in the hospital were all boring. And all the comic books in the, motion, the motionless waiting room he had read before. This time the birth was a hard one. George sat hunched forward in a plastic chair, and David paced around, stomping on the cracks in the linoleum. He leaned on the windowsill, and watched all the cars fly by on the highway, westbound. And in the distance, beyond the barbed wire, sentry towers, and minefields, mysterious, ever unattainable, eastbound. After what seemed like a very long time, the white porcelain doctoroid came back to them. George stood up as soon as it appeared. Is she? Both fine, the doctoroid reported, grill gleaming. A little girl, seven pounds, five ounces. George didn't say anything then, just sat down in the chair. After a while, he came over to David, put his hand on the boy's shoulder, and they both watched the cars moving by, the light of the bright midsummer sun flashing off the windshields as they passed, blinding them. Thank you. I hope uh, this has been thought-provoking, and uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Barton College for having me here to talk to you, and uh, I hope you have a... Uh, a good day and a good year. Bye-bye.